from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Cloud Foundry Summit 2018. Brought to you by the Cloud Foundry Foundation. I'm Stu Miniman and this is theCUBE's coverage of Cloud Foundry Summit 2018 here in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. Happy to welcome back to the program Chip Tilders, who's the CTO of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Uh, I love to, Chip, you started off this morning saying uh, the runners this morning got a taste of the Boston Marathon. They it's did, raining, they did. it's cold, it's miserable. Yesterday At least there was, was less beautiful. wind. Yesterday was absolutely beautiful, uh, right? So we kicked off the summit, beautiful sun but then we had our fun run this morning. As a local, I do apologize for the weather. Normally, <laughs> April's a great time. We want more tech coverage here in the area, more tech shows. There's, we're in the center of a great tech hub here in the Boston seaport, so uh, we, we, we've talked to a couple of Boston startups mm -hmm. uh, you know, here at this show, and you know, great ecosystem uh, if you go there. So thank you for bringing your show here. Absolutely, happy to be here. All right, so uh, last time we caught up was, was a year ago at the show, um, and I, I think it was, what, 213 working days or something is I think Molly something said like that. something uh, like that there yeah. so um, the good thing is in our industry nothing's changing you know we can talk about the Le same stuff as last year pace. no no concern Leisurely everything let's, let's let's just sit back and you know <laughs> talk about our favorite pop culture references uh, but uh, chip what, what 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 what's hot on your plate and what what are you, what are you hearing from uh, the users in the community sure so <clears throat> this year the the theme um, our events team came up with a very fun pun which is running at scale yeah. uh, it means two things one the Boston Marathon was on Monday yeah. but two uh, it really does represent uh, the stories that we're getting from our, our, our users right the customers of the distributions those that use the open source directly um, so not only are we seeing a broadening of adoption across new organizations but they're getting really deep into using it. Um, we field a survey, a uh, user survey, we just did our second run of it. Um, it. In fact, we didn't have this data back in Santa Clara last year, um, so it's, it's been less than a year uh, since the, the 2017 one. And uh, what we found was that there was a 21 point swing in those companies that were using uh, Cloud Foundry with more than 50 developers, right? So 50 developers and higher. Um, when you really talk to the interesting large scale um, you know, Fortune 500 companies, they're talking thousands of developers, you know, working on the platform, being productive, and uh, that truly is kind of what this event is about for us. Yeah. Um you know, I, I, I grew up around the infrastructure stuff and mm -hmm. scale means a lot of things to a lot of people, but had, had a great discussion with Dr. Nick yep. uh, just before talking about how if you were to build your kind of utopian, you know, environment, you, you look at some of the, the hyperscale companies, uh, you know, the, the, the Facebooks and Googles of the world, and the thing is they are at such a scale that if they don't have good automation and don't have, you know, really the distributed architectures that we're all talking about and things like that, there's no way that they could run their businesses. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and the reality is that a lot of the businesses that aren't Google, aren't yeah. Facebook, they have to be able to think about that level of scale. Um, to me, it really boils down to, you know, three basic principles. And, you know, this, to me, this is the best definition of what cloud native means. Whether you're talking about a platform, whether you're talking about how you design your applications, it's simple patterns, highly automated, which can be scaled, at, scaled with ease, right? And through that, you can do really amazing things with software. Um, but it has to be easily scaled, it has to be easily managed, and you do that through the simplicity of the patterns that you apply. Yeah, and, and it's, being simple is, is difficult. Uh, you and, know, yes. how much, you know, we have arguments in the industry. It's like, well, well, let's throw an abstraction layer in or do an overlay or an underlay, um, but, you know, really building kind of distributed, yeah. you know, systems is, is a little bit different. It is a little bit different. Um, so, so one of the things that the Cloud Foundry ecosystem has is a rich history of iterating towards a better and better developer experience. Um, at its heart, you know, the Cloud Foundry ecosystem of, of distributions and tools and, and the different projects we have, they're all about helping a developer be a better developer in the context of their organization. Um, so we've been iterating on that experience and just doing incremental constant improvement and change. Um, and we're, we're very proud of that productivity, right? And that's really what drives these organizations to say, look, this is a, this is a platform that is operated uh, very easily with small teams, right? Um, I think you've spoken with a couple companies and if you ever ask them how many operators do you have to, you know, to handle thousands of engineers, tens of thousands of applications, they say, well, maybe 10. Yeah. The, the T-Mobile example was a great 10, example. 10 to 15 operators with 1,700 developers. So. Yep. Yep. That, 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 that's good. It's it was uh, it, it's funny because I remember we used to talk about you know like in the enterprise how many servers can a single admin handle and then if you go yeah. to the hyperscale ones it was three orders of magnitude different, but 
in the hyperscale ones, they didn't really have server people. Yep. They had people that brought in servers and people that threw them in the wood chipper when they were done. Absolutely. And they didn't manage them. It was the old, uh, you know, uh, cattle versus pets uh, an analogy that we talked uh, yeah. about in the other room. So it's, it's you know, it's different, it's just totally different mindsets is how we think about this. Um, I, I, I love, you know, for me, it was in the enterprise, you know, we harden the hardware, we think about this, and in the software world, it's, you know, no, no, I built it in the application layer because it, my, one of my favorite lines I use is, you know, hardware will eventually fail and software will eventually work, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that's the difference between, so application-centric thinking yeah. leads you to, necessarily, you have to have infrastructure to run it, right? Uh, my favorite, you know, favorite thing is this whole serverless term is, is absolutely ridiculous if anybody understands it, but there's a little bit behind it, which is, in fact, I'd argue Cloud Foundry is fundamentally serverless because when you push code into it, you don't care what operating system's underneath it, right? All you care about is the fact that you've written some code in Java or in Node.js or you know, in Ruby, you're handing it to a platform, it deals with all of the details of you know, building a container image, scaling it, managing it, pulling in dependencies. You don't care what underlying operating system's there. And then that 10-person platform operations team in the Cloud Foundry world, they have the benefit of the upstream projects actually producing the operating system image that they can consume within within hours of major vulnerabilities being announced. Yeah, and it, it's, I, I love actually, at this show, you've got a containers and serverless track. We do. Um, and as I said, I'm an infrastructure guy by background, and when we went to virtualization, we went a little bit up the stack, I don't mm -hmm. think about servers, I'm trying to get closer to that application. What you know, I'd love, love you to comment on is Cloud Foundry helps give some stability and control at that infrastructure level, but you know, it's still involved with infrastructure if I'm in my own data center or a hosted yep. data center, or I know what cloud I'm on. When I start going up to like serverless, it's I'm a little bit higher up the stack, and that's why they don't they could live together. Uh, yeah, and yeah. it's you know it's closer tied to the application than it is to the infrastructure. So maybe you could tease that out for us a little. Yeah. So so I think one of the main things that we've heard from the user community, and this is actually coming from users of uh, a number of the different distributions, they're saying, look. There are roughly, today, roughly two different modes that we care about cloud-native application workloads. And this might expand to include function as a service, but predominantly there's two. There's the custom software that we write, which the PaaS experience is great for. And then there's the ISV-delivered software, which it, today, increasingly, the medium of, of software delivery is becoming the container image. Whether it's an OCI container, or whether you know, it's a Docker image, ISV ships software as container images, and you need a great place to land that. So those two abstractions, that, that PaaS just hand the system your code, or the container service just hand it a container image, both of them work really well together, um, and part of what we're trying to do as a community, a technical community, is we're evolving those integrations so that um, we can work really well with the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, there are different options for how these things might be stacked depending on the vendor that you're talking to. I think mostly that's immaterial to the customers. I think mostly the customers care about having those two experiences be unified from their developer or app owner perspective. Yeah, um, when, when you come to this show, there's more than just Cloud Foundry. There's a lot of other projects that, oh, that, sure. that are coming on in the space. Can you give us a little viewpoint as to how the foundation looks at this? Um, you know, what, what's, what's the charter which it fits under Linux and the Linux Foundation? Uh, and yeah. you know, there's so many different pieces and some kind of bleed into what the CNCF's doing and I, I'm just trying to help map out uh, yeah. you know, how some of these pieces and it's, it's this great toolbox that you know we've talked about in open source. Right. Uh, I love like the Zipcar uh, guy got up and he's like, I use all the peripheral stuff and none of the core stuff. And, right. and that's right. okay. Absolutely, uh, you you know? Know, that's the fun of open source. So, yeah. so there's a couple ways to look at this. So first, the open source communities collectively, there's a lot of innovation going on in this space, obviously. Um, what the Cloud Foundry ecosystem generally does, historically has done and will continue to do is that we are focused on the user needs first and foremost. And what our technical project teams do is they look at what's available in the broader open source ecosystem. They adopt and integrate what makes sense, uh, where we have to build something ourselves um, simply because there, there isn't an equivalent or, or it's necessary you know, for technical reasons, we'll, we'll build that software. Um, but our architecture has changed many times, um, in fact, since 2015, right? It hasn't been that many years, as you said, that, you know, we move slow in this, in this, in this industry. Um, <laughs> we've changed this architecture constantly, right? The upstream project's releasing at minimum of twice a month. That's a pretty high velocity, and it's a big coordinated release. 
Um, so we're going to continue to evolve the architecture to bring in new components. This is where CNCF relates. Um, we've integrated Envoy, which is a CNCF project. We've, we're, we're now bringing in uh, Kubernetes in a couple of different ways. Um, we're working closely with Istio, which is not a CNCF project yet, um, but it looks like it might head that way. Um, service mesh capabilities. Um, we were an early adopter of the container networking interface. Um, another Linux Foundation effort was the Open Container Initiative, right, seeded from some code from Docker. Again, one of the earliest platforms to adopt that outside of Docker. Um, so we really look at the, the entire spectrum of open source software as a, a rich you know, market of, of componentry that can be brought together. And we bring it together so that all these great users that you're talking to um, can go along this journey. And it's, think of it as almost a rationalization of the the innovative chaos that's occurring, right? So we, we rationalize that, our job is to rationalize, our distributions use that rationalization, and then all of the users get to take advantage of new things that come up. Um, but also, we take what gets integrated very seriously because it has to reach a point of maturity. T-Mobile, again, running their whole business on Cloud Foundry. Comcast, running their whole business on Cloud Foundry. The US Air Force, fundamentally running their air traffic control, right? How do they get fuel to the jets on Cloud Foundry? So we take that seriously. Um, and so it's this combination of harvest the innovation from where we can harvest it, bring it all together, be very thoughtful about how we bring it together, um, and then the distributions get the advantage of saying, here's a stable core that's going to evolve and take us into the future. All right, yeah, Chip, I, I've loved the discussion with, you know, real customers doing the digital transformation, what that means for them, how they're moving their business forward. I want to give you the final word. Uh, for those that, that couldn't come to the show, I know a lot of the stuff's online, there's a lot of information out there. Anything particular you want to call out or say, hey, you know, this is cool, interesting, or exciting you um, that, that you'd want to point to? Yeah, um, I, I actually, there are a lot of things, but the, the one thing that I'll point to is, um, as a U.S. citizen, I'm particularly proud of some of the work that's happening in the U.S. government. Um, through 18F um, with cloud.gov as, as an example. Um, but if I step back even further, um, Cloud Foundry is serving as a vehicle for collaboration across multiple nations right now. We're seeing Australia, we're seeing the United Kingdom, Netherlands, Canada, South Korea. Um, all of these national you know, governments are trying to figure out how to change citizen engagement to, to follow the lead of the startups, which you know, or the you know the internet companies, um, at the same time that these large you know, uh, Fortune 500 companies are also trying to digitally transform. Governments are trying to do the same thing. So we had a, a we're we're almost done the day here, uh, but there was a full day track of of governments talking about their use of the tech, uh, talking about that same digital transformation journey. Um, so to me, that's actually really inspiring to see that happen. All right. Well, Chip Childers. He was a dancing stick figure in I the was. keynote this morning. I was. But here with us on theCUBE, thank you so much for joining once again, and thank you to the foundation uh, for helping us bring this, uh, this program into our audience. Yeah, we're happy to have you here. I'm Stu Miniman, and this is theCUBE. Thanks for watching.